welcome to episode 245 of the Postal Hub podcast. I'm Ian Kerr, and in a moment I'll be joined by Dean McCuba from Last Mile Experts North America to talk about contracting models in the last mile. We'll look at FedEx Ground, Amazon's delivery service partners, ooh, maybe even a bit of Australia Post contracting as well. Before we get to that discussion though, a quick reminder to subscribe to the Daily Delivery Digest. It's a weekly email, not weekly, it's daily. It's a daily email, that's why it's called the Daily Delivery Digest. A daily email with headlines from around the delivery world, plus an analysis piece every day, every weekday at least, direct to your inbox. Go to thepostalhub.com, follow the links to the Daily Delivery Digest and sign up there. Now, coming up in a moment, Dean McCuba from Last Mile Experts North America on contracting models in the last mile. Joining me on the line is Dean McCuba. Dean is managing partner for Last Mile Experts North America. Dean, welcome. We're going to get stuck into contracting models uh, in the last mile, to be specific. Got a couple of examples there from the USA. I'm going to talk a little bit about contracting in Australia, and we're going to see what comes out of all of this. But, Dean, before we go off on uh, uh, this discussion, can you just share a little bit of the background to uh, to how FedEx ha- developed its own or acquired its own contracting model? Uh, first of all, thanks for having me, Ian. It was back in the uh, early 80s when uh, some entrepreneurs created a new ground pickup and delivery company for commercial use only called RPS. And uh, RPS used or or created a a, a contractor model where the local driver, at that time it was the driver, owned a territory. And they were responsible for pickup and delivery in that territory. They were compensated uh, by miles, by per package charges. And the better they ran their company and the more efficient they were, the more money they made. So it was a pure contractor model. It was the first of its kind, really, uh, of any size uh, in the U.S. Just before, well, we're in around uh, 1998, FedEx acquired uh, RPS, and then in 2000, rebranded the company as FedEx Ground. FedEx saw what was happening with the growth of e-commerce, and their FedEx Express unit was primarily a B2B service provider, and there it wasn't designed to move ground shipments or less costly ground shipments that, than express shipments. And obviously, you needed a low-cost shipment to support the growth of e-commerce. So that's how, how FedEx uh, got into the ground contracting business. Uh, there are two distinct and separate operating models, FedEx Express, which is an employee model, and FedEx Ground, which is a contractor model. Uh, However, FedEx has slowly been merging the operations of the two companies, and many people are speculating that at some point in the future, uh, they may merge it all into one company, and if they should do that, it'll probably be a lower-cost contractor model versus an employee model, and that would be only to cover both pickup and uh, delivery operations. Now, one of the other delivery operators in North America that operates a contractor model is Amazon. Amazon's got its DSP model. And DSP is the delivery service partner. Is that, no, what is it? Delivery service partner? That's correct. So the DSP model, which is a, a contracting model. So, Dean, Let's just sort of compare these two ways of operating. Are they identical or are they different? And if they're different, so what are some of the key ways that they differ? You know, there, there's one primary way that they differ. With the FedEx ground model, the contractor owns a territory, a group of zip codes, is responsible for all the pickup and delivery operations in that territory. They own it. It can accrue value based on the performance of the territory, and the ground contractor can then sell it. So FedEx territories can sell for over $1 million. So it's a, it's a pure entrepreneurial model that allows the 
actually they're called GSPs now, the ground service provider, it, that allows them to improve their business, uh, make it worth more, and then sell it at a profit. The Amazon model is just a model where someone is hired to manage a territory, but they don't own that territory. They just provide or manage services for that territory. Amazon is fairly supportive in getting them started up. It, it costs a fraction uh, in terms of uh, upfront capital to become an Amazon GSP versus a FedEx ground service provider. But the difference is the potential for both earning revenue based on operations or efficient operations and the ability to have your territory accrue in value and then be able to sell it. The FedEx ground territory is much more profitable in both the short term and the long term than the Amazon model but it costs significantly less to get into the Amazon model. So if you're going to get into the FedEx ground scene, if you're going to be a contract, have a, hold the contract there, or you said territory, which almost makes it sound like a franchise, Dean. So is this something you have to buy into, or do you, what's sort of the process there for how somebody becomes a ground contractor? In, in general, you have to buy an existing ground territory. Right. There, there is one exception when the FedEx will have to absorb a territory for whatever reason. And then if, if that happens, then FedEx would be more flexible in selling such uh, territory because it's open. But 95% of the town, time, you have to purchase an existing territory. And so you're purchasing the territory from the existing ground contractor holder, or whatever the correct term is, yeah? So it's like you're buying a small business. It, it, it is absolutely. And the, you know, the analogy of the franchise, it's, it's, it's pretty close. It, it is almost a franchise because you're representing yourself under the franchise name, or in this case, the corporate name, FedEx Ground, but you're really running the company on your own per very strict guidelines that the parent company forces you to to work by. There are some courier models in other parts of the world where it is termed a franchise and you'll buy a franchise and you are then responsible for that area and making deliveries in that area and you have the the the, the franchisor's system. So the branding and the software and the hardware and all of that. So you are basically operating as a franchise. When we look at the Amazon model, it's a lot newer, shall we say. It's only been up and running for a few years in the USA and it's up and running in other parts of the world as well. But it's not a contract that you buy as such. How, how well, or tell me if I'm wrong, how do you get into it? You apply, you go online. These territories, uh, a- Amazon is continuously growing the size of their service network by their DSPs. So when they started two, two and a half years ago, they, they, they started in very large markets. Then they moved over to middle-sized markets. And now they're putting terminals and offering territories to, I wouldn't say rural, but less dense suburban areas. So as they grow their delivery territory that they're supporting directly on their own, They'll just put those routes uh, out there and you can apply online and uh, you may be awarded the territory and then you're entrusted to manage the territory. One, one big difference, right now it's just deliveries. So it's a fairly simplified model. And that also might explain why FedEx ground model, the FedEx ground model pays more than the Amazon model. Because you've got to remember, all those deliveries you're making have to originate somewhere, and that's a pickup. And it's normally a consolidated pickup where there's a bunch of packages. So the FedEx ground contractor is also making the pickup. It's usually a high volume pickup. And because their business is both sides of the pickup and delivery cycle, the potential for the FedEx ground driver is to make more. They have a greater potential to make more than the Amazon driver because the Amazon driver is focused strictly on deliveries. And is there a term to the contract that uh, you get with a either a FedEx ground or with an Amazon DSP deal? Is there a term to the contract where it's three years or five years, or is it just a, 
unlimited. Why, why does it work? Okay, so it's very clear uh, on the FedEx model, they're one to two year terms. And unless you're in violation of the terms and conditions of the contract, the, uh, the parent company, FedEx, can't terminate you early. And then if they are going to terminate you, they have to provide a certain amount of notice. Uh, the same holds true for the service provider. They have to give FedEx notice. And here's the rub with these contractor models. If, if you're FedEx and you have a large uh, ground service provider or contractor that, let's say, has 30 or 35 delivery routes, if he should, for whatever reason, close up shop, then FedEx ground has to figure out how to cover 35 additional routes overnight without having a contractor lined up to come in to, to, to step in and do it. This is the, the major drawback for a company like FedEx is if they should lose a contractor overnight or within a, a short number of days for whatever reason, even if they're in violation of their contract, which they would be, they're going to struggle for many, many weeks to provide service in that territory because they don't have any backup employees to, to come in and service the territory. Now, FedEx ground operations do carry a very small number of employed drivers, but it's not nearly enough to cover an opening if a ground service provider should pull the plug without notice. We read recently about uh, an Amazon DSP that pulled the plug on its relationship with Amazon because it wasn't satisfied with various aspects of the contract relationship. So, and there was a, a significant number of employees, Dean, from memory. It was 100 and something people were going to be affected by this. So, where it's not just the likes of FedEx Ground that can suffer a sudden loss of capacity if, if a contractor decides to pull the plug. Now, this, though, is not a new problem, is it? And there's always been the risk with any contractor model or even with an employee model. If an employee decides one day just not just turn up, well, then you've got to cover that. But if a contractor that has various routes or might have you know, dozens of drivers out there delivering, if they pull the plug and say, well, that's it, I'm not going to do any more work for FedEx Ground or for Amazon or for whoever, well, it's not a new problem, surely. It, no, it, it, it's not a new problem. What is new is the volume of business that these, the, it's mostly e-commerce business, the volume of business that these contractor models are now handling. So the exposure to FedEx and Amazon is greater because so much more volume is on the line. Let's shift our focus now to what happens in Australia. Now, with Australia Post, Australia Post has a couple of different kinds of contracts, uh, that's delivery contracts. One is, uh, let's just call it sort of a letters and parcels kinds of contract, and the other is a pure parcels contract. Now, people listening to this from Australia will say, well, it's not quite like that, Ian, and I know it's not. We're simplifying a little bit here. But let's just focus on the parcel contracts. The parcel contracts that Australia Post has are five-year terms, and uh, subject to a competitive tender process. So Australia Post will say, here's the route. We reckon it needs one or two or three vans, whatever it is. Uh, we estimate there are going to be X number of parcels per day um, and it will increase such and such a rate during the Christmas peak. <laughs> I might not do that anymore in the contract. Uh, and it invites then uh, interested people to tender for the contract. In other words, say, this is how much I would charge Australia Post for to do the contract. And then Australia Post goes through a selection procedure and then awards the contract, not always to the cheapest uh, tenderer, but to someone who's got the right mix of being cheap and reliable, I suppose. That's a, again, don't write me letters, everybody. I know I'm oversimplifying here. But there's a few key things about this, Dean. And one is that by being a five-year contract, you know that the costs are going to be over those five years. And so this is something I'd like to use to sort of compare with what happens in your neck of the woods. If someone is taking on a contract in North America, how are they able to con calculate the, you know, uh, the, the costs of their vehicles along with their wages and everything else across that term, just in, in simple terms here, Dean? 
so what you have is you have all these running rates and you're going to see that information in the numbers, in the books, when the existing route owner is in the process of selling it to, to someone else. So the numbers, if you have any type of, of business sense, you can just look at the numbers and you can see that it's taking three or four or five years to depreciate a vehicle. And then after that, the uh, contractor tends to to drive that vehicle to 110 or 120% of capability and then and then and purchase a new one. So really it, what's key is that you look at the existing running rates and and then also what's interesting is there's a number of consultants out there that help new entrants into the FedEx ground terminal space that help them navigate the territory. So there's a lot of help out there to to support new owners getting into that type of business for the first time. And when you say driving them to 110%, does that mean driving them into the ground, basically, Dean? Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I think that's safe. And, and one, one of the things that I find interesting is FedEx made a, a big commitment to EVs in the past two months. And it was, it was an amazing commitment. Uh, it was over maybe 10 or 20 years, not as quickly to evolving to uh, an, an EV fleet versus a, a gas-powered fleet. But what I'm curious about is how are they going to force that implementation with the ground contractors? And well, the way I think it's going to happen is when a contract comes up for agreement, FedEx is simply going to start mandating, you know, within yeah. one or two, 20% of your fleet has to be electric. Interestingly enough, uh, New Zealand Post had a bit of a crack at this in the last oh, 12 or 18 months. They introduced a scheme whereby there would be an incentive for contractors to take on electric vehicles because this is uh, – how can I put this without, without um, putting it too unkindly? But if you're a contractor and you're looking at costs, you can be very conscious of upfront, upfront purchase price of an electric vehicle and, um, compared to an internal combustion engine vehicle and then the ongoing running costs and all that, which you know, people will say, well, it costs less to run an electric vehicle. Well, there are a lot of assumptions around that as opposed to the no, the devil you know, as they say. Um, but, Dean, when we look at um, these contracting models, and we just touched on it there, one of the reasons that companies, whether it's FedEx Ground or postal operators or Amazon, one of the reasons they look very seriously at these models is because of cost, right? So, and I think you might have mentioned with uh, with FedEx when it took, with FedEx Ground, I beg your pardon, when it took on the, was it RSP? Was that the name of the company? RPS. RPS, I beg your pardon. You know, the, the, the cost reduction is part of it. So, Looking into your crystal ball, and we need to ask you about this since you were very accurately predicted that uh, Amazon would, would that the regulators in the USA would look at breaking up Amazon. Check. I'll, I'll, look, I'll look it up, everybody, and I'll put it on the uh, on the Postal Hub website as to what episode it was that Dean talked about this. But looking into the future, what do you see as, as some of the trends here in contracting? Will companies stick with contracting as opposed to employees? What What do you think is going to happen here? I think what's going to happen is companies like FedEx and UPS, who are, they're both wonderful companies. Is the work incredibly hard? Yes, but they're well-run companies. I worked at both those companies. And what I think will happen is they have to lower their labor rates to be competitive with these companies like the regional carriers who primarily have contractor models. Uh, So they're probably going to slowly let their legacy employees go away. They're going to retire, whatever. They're going to quit. And then they'll probably start implementing lower cost employee models that may either be contractor models or very similar to contractor on demand models. And I will tell you one example FedEx has hired a large number of on demand employees. And they get an hourly rate, and it's a decent rate. I think it's in, in, in it's about seventeen or eighteen dollars an hour. They don't get any benefits. They have no scheduled work slots. They have a large number of these employees per terminal, 
And then for some reason, let's say they have a territory that gets blown out with residential deliveries. They have a bank of 10 or 30 or 40 on-demand employees that they can call up and say, can you come in in one hour and, and do a route for us? So what that means is it's not a pure contractor model, but it's an on-demand model, and it allows them to get closer to lowering their costs to compete with other contractor models. And also part of this is capacity. And you've hinted at it earlier in our conversation today, that capacity is key and that with the growth in the e-commerce parcel volumes, all the carriers, FedEx Ground, even Amazon and all the posts, are looking at being able to provide that capacity in and out of peak season. And if our good friend Marek Rzecki were on this call, he would at this point say something about, something about parcel lockers. <laughs> yes, he would. Uh, or out-of-home delivery of some description. Do you think that that has any role to play uh, right now when in, in the last mile scene in North America? Or do you think it's just something that the last mile in North America is just starting to wake up to? Uh, no, you know, FedEx and UPS in the past three or four years have probably opened 80 to 100,000 access points. We use our relationship with, with retail networks, Walgreens, CVS, Michaels, things like that, where customers can go to that store to pick up their parcels. And what their what, what the two major carriers are doing via their uh, interactive uh, delivery capabilities, and Merrick would also reference that, what, what, they're, what they're doing with those is they're slowly trying to modify behavior of both the person purchasing online and then the recipient to either designate that their parcels be delivered to an access point, or if you're the recipient, redirect those shipments. It's a big deal. As we know, in Europe, parcel lockers are a big hit. They've been a bit of a failure here in the U.S. So here we're moving towards retail access points, where in Europe, obviously, parcel lockers are, are very, very strong. So we're getting there. We're getting there in a different way than you are in Europe. Dean, before we wrap up, I've talked a little bit about Australia Post and its parcel contractor model. I mean, c- contracting has been part of Australia Post's delivery model for decades, decades and decades and decades, um, especially when you think about rural delivery. And, and really, over the last 20 years, there's been a big focus on getting parcels delivered by contract. Dean, I haven't asked you about the US Postal Service and anything it might be doing in the contracting scene. Okay, they have been in the contracting scene for a number of years. I'm not totally expert on the history there, so I'm not gonna make claims that I can't substantiate, but they have been in operating in that space. It's, uh, it's rural areas where they tend to use these contractors. Uh, they absolutely allow the USPS to reduce their operating costs versus sending their unionized uh, carriers out to these rural markets that aren't very dense and cost a lot to operate in. I think the big question here is, as we go through this incredible soul searching at our USPS to decide on how to reduce operating costs and how can we work with the the terms and conditions of uh, collective bargaining agreements via the union representation, the question is that the USPS move more towards that. Does the uh, do the unions allow them to move more towards contracted drivers to reduce operating costs and all those uh, all those uh, losses that they're suffering? I think that's really something to watch here in the U.S. An interesting point, Dean, about the role of a contracted delivery force in the future of the post, what it would mean for letter pricing, parcel pricing, the universal service obligation, and all that a discussion for another time and I think I might have a queue of people who'd want to talk about that <laughs> on the podcast. Dean, if people want to get in contact with you, if they're thinking about taking on a FedEx ground route or an Amazon DSP contract or if they just want to find out more, how should they get in contact with you? They, they can just find me on LinkedIn at uh, Dean, M-A-C-I-U-B-A. 
I will chuck a link to Dean's LinkedIn profile on thepostalhub.com if you haven't been able to jot that down. And you can go over there to LinkedIn to harass Dean and uh, ask him questions about everything except parcel lockers. No, (laughs) kidding, Dean. Uh, Ask him about parcel lockers as well, just to spice up his day. All right, Dean McCuba, Last Mile Experts in North America. Thank you very much for joining us on the Postal Hub podcast today. Thank you for having me, Ian. Coming soon on the Postal Hub podcast, Peter Summers, CEO of Emirates Post, and many other great guests. Now, usually in this part of the podcast, I say something about subscribing to the Postal Hub newsletter, and you can still do that. I'd love it if you did. It's a weekly newsletter with the podcast in it, plus any other bits and pieces that I've written during the week. But then there's this other great thing that I'm doing called the Daily Delivery Digest. You may have heard about it because I mentioned it in the intro for this very podcast, in fact. The Daily Delivery Digest is a daily email direct to your inbox with the latest headlines from around the delivery world, plus some analysis as well. Go to thepostalhub.com to sign up for both of these great things, or email newsletters, whatever you want to call them. Uh, What else should I tell you? I don't know. I hope you're having a lovely day. How are you? I'm fine. (laughs) Um, Oh, look, you know the rest. Subscribe on your favourite podcast platform. Leave a rating too because it's just a nice thing to do. And if you want to contact me about anything at all, my email address is ian at thepostalhub.com. That's it, ian at thepostalhub.com. I'm Ian Kerr. Thanks for listening in. I look forward to your company next time on the Postal Hub podcast.